So, are we brain dead, or do we want, we should continue, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, anybody need to jump up and do a jumping jack or something? <laughs> a burpee? Okay, so what is more important, because sometimes we have conflicts between the two of these. And I'm just going to let you guys think about that for a minute or so. And think about when you might have a conflict, because we want to fulfill, fulfill all of these, right? If you can't fulfill them together, which one might be more important? allows uh, the response to be distorted right there. 
Does that match something of your example? Or do you have an opposite example? Or I was thinking in an in, in invasive species. Oh, okay. That do, I mean, you have the native uh, okay. range, uh -huh. and then you have another, another uh, range, that, okay. but uh, it's completely driven by people because it's people that is releasing that for okay. some. Right. So in, in this case, you have uh, the introduced uh, range is relating probably both assumptions mm -hmm. because first, you have the noise of a human releasing. Yeah. This uh, is not natural. And also you cannot have a representation of this introduced right. range probably has not the, all the variables that is included right. in the native okay. range. Right. Well so let's think about the human part here. Are in this case do you think that the humans are simply allowing it to succeed in dispersing? And then it's it's becoming natural. It's a new yeah, I think for example, you can you can have a, a pet. Uh -huh. So you go to a shop, yeah. buy a pet, That's and the pet uh, becomes pretty hard, or very big, or whatever, and you just decide to release because it's disturbing your phone. Right. But you release in any place. It's not uh, you are not following the the. Right. the right. suitable necessities right. of the animal. Right. 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 And in some cases, the animal is the same. Right, <coughs> but I think in that case, um, the, the randomness... Yeah, it, it's random. Yeah, right. But what happens is, we let the environment take care of that and decide where can the population survive and where do populations not survive. Okay? So, if it's allowed to become naturalized, and then it has its response to that environment and the new area, okay? So if, if humans are only adding noise to the system, it's not a problem. If, if the problem is when we bias the particular areas that are suitable versus not suitable based on the environmental variables we want to make the model, okay? So I think these are two really good examples that are different and that, that will help us understand. In your case, let me put it this way. You could have, if you have a smaller study region just in the dunes, <coughs> you could have more violation of this, but you're not violating that. <coughs> yeah. So you would have uh, a better estimate of the species response to the, your variables, but over a smaller range of environmental conditions. Okay? If you modeled over the large region, which includes a take, so you're taking comparison data from a larger region, which includes areas where the species could be found, but humans are taking the plant out, you would have an estimate of the species response over a larger environmental range, but a biased estimate of its response. So you have to ask yourself, would I rather have a good estimate over a smaller range of conditions, or a bad biased estimate over a larger range of conditions. I have a question. Yes. For example, you get of this invasive species, it has a little the wasp that really stops its, its growing because it, uh, it infects the flowering, so it creates like a bowl on the flowering area, it reduces the dispersal. So, for example, in, even in Australia, it's probably not as grown as much as it should have because there's this agent there. Right. So, even for example, if I would pick up and do the study in Australia, I'm not sure it's to me that it's all the full range of it occupied because it's native there. Uh -huh. It might not be true because it's having invasive behavior here uh -huh. and it's growing to a much larger niche to pick it right? So, I think that relates to the invasive question. Yeah. One, invasive species are very interesting and very difficult. One question is, are there any evolutionary differences between the populations? So far, we're assuming that there's not. Um, we have this huge question, are the critical biotic interactions different in the two regions? And so far, we're, we're assuming they're not, okay? And that's where it's very interesting to feel to be trying to integrate those kind of things. Um, but if we don't have uh, differences in genetics, we don't have to 
I mean, functional differences in genetics, if we don't have differences in key biotic interactions, then the only difference in the species response should be the range of conditions available and you know, the, the effects of movement of where has it been able to, uh, to reach and uh, establish populations. So in the invasive species one, if, for example, if you put your native records and your um, uh, invaded records together, then you would probably have a larger range of conditions that would be uh, more closely um, matching the, the niche space assumption. You're, you're more likely to see the full response, right? Um, but you have to think about, well, is the species uh, more likely to be at equilibrium with our abiotic variables in the native range or in the invaded range? So if it's been in the invaded range just a little time, then including information from the invaded range may really give you a false estimate of what its response is, right? If it's been there a long time and is at equilibrium with those abiotic conditions, then it's probably okay, right? And so this would be, in this case, I would be worried about the dispersal and demographic <coughs> Okay? Just because it hasn't had time to establish populations and, and really have kind of the correct uh, final response um, to, to the abiotic conditions that are there. So think about these, um, and my perspective is that I would I mean, try to fulfill the noise assumptions, right? Um, so that we don't have a biased estimate of our uh, responses. Um, even if that means you have to make your models over a smaller range of environmental conditions. Because to me, it sounds more, it sounds better to have a good estimate over a smaller range of conditions than a biased estimate over a larger range of conditions. But then, we have to be very, very uh, cautious when we extrapolate to non-analog conditions. If we have these truncated responses and we want to apply it somewhere else, we have to be especially careful. So that is, that's my proposal. Okay, the last section is how do we take niche models of suitability that we're trying to build and how do we link those to reality of what the species actually can occupy? So, um, in order to transfer, it needs to be a, a model of suitability, right? All these principles we've been talking about, and variables, and all of that kind of stuff. We can't include, for example, latitude, longitude, it's not going to uh, mean something somewhere else, right? Um, this niche model, we apply it to another place, another time. This shows us, hopefully, the areas that are suitable. But, Often we don't want to know simply what's suitable, we want to know what's going to be occupied, right? So in order to do so, we have to link these uh, with other kinds of models that are spatially explicit and they model dispersal and demography, okay? So this is gonna take us through how I think all of these parts fit together. So we have our niche model, we apply it to the future suitable areas, and I'm going to use uh, purple for data inputs. So we need um, estimates of uh, future climates for the variables that we use to make the model. Okay? That is one thing that feeds into the dispersal simulation. Okay? The most advanced ones include both dispersal and demography things. Uh, for example, by Damien Fordham um, and his collaborators are really, really uh, very exciting. Um, but I will probably just call those dispersal uh, simulations. Okay, but we also need to know, we need to apply the niche model to current suitable areas. And I'll show you why. This is because we're going to need to see the dispersal simulation. It's going to have to start with what the species actually occupies today. Okay? But if we take our niche model, apply it to current suitable areas, 
Does that show us where the species actually is found today? No, it shows us what's suitable today. So we have to process this estimate before we can feed it in as the seed for the dispersal simulation. So we have to have data on what areas have been sampled, not sampled. We need to uh, consider land cover or other types of information that reflects uh, areas that the humans have changed the environment. Um, we have to consider the actual areas occupied by really key biotic interactors. All of this to get to our estimate of what the species actually occupies. Take what's suitable and figure out what is occupied, what subset is occupied. Okay? By taking into account dispersal, biotic interactions, and human uh, uh, modifications of the environment. Okay? One way around this land cover thing is if we had included those kinds of variables actually as predictors in the model. Okay? But if we haven't, we obviously have to consider the human footprint. With this estimate of what areas are actually occupied, that feeds into the dispersal simulation to tell it where to start. Okay? So instead of starting with all the areas suitable, it's going to start with all the areas that are occupied. And then it's going to move around uh, into future time slices to figure out which areas are likely to actually be occupied in the future. Um, but other data goes into this. So the simulation also needs uh, information on dispersal abilities, and uh, some of these use demographic <coughs> parameters. Um, and then we have to have uh, estimates of future land cover and the future occupied areas of key biotic interactors if we think that these are going to be important uh, for our species. And for most species, they probably are, right? Um, at least the effects of humans, OK? And I'm using land cover very, very broadly for any kind of variable we have that is useful for determining, um, kind of characterizing the effects of, of human modifications. Okay, so with this seed and that projection of what will be suitable and then all of this other information, the dispersal simulation can estimate future occupied areas. And now we see all, the whole thing with all of the data inputs. I put the purples back on. And then the next slide is gonna show what happened uh, in order to get this niche model and then put it all together. So this is the whole thing, starting from occurrence records and environmental data, our algorithm, moving into the niche model, everything that has to go into the other algorithm, the dispersal simulation, uh, in order to get our estimates of the future occupied areas. So. I mean, I mentioned many of you have seen these kind of studies, right? I mean, there's some really, really exciting ones. Anybody seen the videos they have for the Iberian lynx? No? Yeah? It's really cool. All right, questions, comments, uh, thoughts of anything missing, <coughs> the overall flowchart? We may be done for this is session. There, uh, sorry, is there any uh, any more popular method for when this model is in this kind of? I think mean, that's the worst person to ask. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there are some from the